subscribing for the first time to one of our Tech Tuesdays. We uh, host this monthly meetup for teachers um, of all types, um, but we specifically cater to the digital fabrication teachers, um, as that's what KTD specializes in. And um, today we are very happy to have a guest speaker, Tom Lutz. And Tom is uh, from MIT's uh, Center for Bits and Atoms. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do a um, just a quick introduction and um, we'll do a presentation with Tom, uh, one with myself, and, uh, and hopefully have a good amount of time to answer questions and just have a little bit of discussion. It's usually a pretty casual presentation when we do our Tech Tuesdays. Um, we, uh, we do have um, if a chat feature if you are using Teams for the first time. Uh, I'm gonna just punch something in here. In case you do want to chime in um, through chat and you want to ask a question, that's fine. We'll be monitoring that. All right. So um, quickly, uh, my name is Adam Zelny. I'm the application specialist with AT Labs. I specialize in the digital fabrication tools we outfit for high schools and universities. Um, I love design. I love all, all that stuff. Uh, computers, helping machines do amazing things and, uh, and by turn, helping humans do amazing things. And I'm just going to pass it right over to Tom. Hi, um, my name is Tom Letts. I'm a technical instructor at MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. Um, I'm just going to say that I apologize if you hear any background noise. I've got two little critters that are kind of tearing up my room right now, but um, I don't know if you can hear them. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, so I work at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, and we recently got a Stratasys J55 printer, and it's definitely been kind of a game changer as far as what we can do, um, at least as far as what the prints we are putting out um, look like, uh, and you know, do anything that has to do with color or multi-materials. Um, it's really been a pretty eye-opening experience, and. I wanted to show you some photos of things that we've printed since we got our printer, which was about Christmas time. So it's still fairly new to us, but I think there's a good variety of um, different types of things. And I uh, definitely would like to hear from you. Feel free to interrupt me and um, throw out questions if you have them. And I am going to take the screen over and share some stuff. All right. And while he's while Tom, you're doing that, uh, Kristen, do you want to give yourself a quick introduction? Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Kristen. I work at, in marketing at AT Labs, so um, I will be monitoring the chat, and I'll also be sending you guys an email with the recording tomorrow. Thank you. And we also have uh, Dave Kemsky, uh, AT's founder, um, with us today, and we're hoping he'll jump in at some point and show us the printer on site that we have in our demo lab. Um, I'm going to let Tom take it away. Um, after Tom's presentation, we're, we'll talk a little bit about Keyshot, which is uh, some rendering software that we can use to um, kind of like prepare CAD files for uh, the J55. But for now, Tom, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, so this is, uh, I think that the first thing that I really did when we got the J55, um, and you know, a big part of my job will be, we get a new machine and the professor I work for says, I want you to play with it. You know, I want you to figure out what it can do, what it can't do. Um, and there's a lot of freedom within that for me to, in this case, print stuff that I think is cool or design and print stuff that I think is cool. But one of the first things that I did when we got the J55 was went on to sketchfab.com, which is a great resource. Um, it's kind of similar to GrabCAD and Thing Thingiverse in the sense that it's a place where you can go and download models that you can then print um, or put into 3D environments for other applications on your computer. But this is just kind of like a grab bag of models that I pulled off of Sketchfab that I thought were really cool. Um, the idea of getting things from Thingiverse and GrabCAD is not new to me, but this is the first time that we've really been able to take advantage of, you know, downloading a model that's got color and texture built into it and then sending it to the printer and it just printing it in, in those colors and textures. So 
really cool new capability for, for us. Uh, definitely, we're excited about that. And just a couple of kind of antique type things and some more like um, artifact type things and biological type things. But the uh, this one in particular in the bottom left, I think, is uh, this looks to me something like when Adam shows what Keyshot can do, like an application that is, you know, where this thing has really got this texture on the surface of it. Um, it looks like something that could be potentially made in Keyshot. And so I'm excited to learn more about Keyshot because I just found out about it kind of recently. Um, yeah. All right, this is one of my size 16 New Balances. Uh, I'm six foot eight, so I've got pretty large feet. Um, one of the other cool toys that we have at the Center for Bits and Atoms is a really um, high tech 3D scanner that's made by a company called Artec. And uh, the name of the scanner is the Leo. So it's the Artec Leo. And aside from being a really, you know, powerful scanner, it's also completely wireless. And so you get away from that issue that you typically have with 3D scanners where you're kind of tethered to a computer and trying to work your way around this object without tripping over something or making sure that you're not getting too far away. This really frees you up to move around the object as you want. Um, so that's the Artec Leo scanner, but just showing an example of how nice of it, not only a job that it got um, scanning this sneaker, but then also the, um, how well it printed as well on the J55. And like, they were joking about, oh, I wish there were more scuff marks on your sneaker because uh, my sneaker's pretty dirty. But there is actually a reasonable example of, if you look at this spot that I'm mousing around right now, and then go down into here, um, you can see that it picked that up as a texture kind of. This has got blue dots on it. This was me experimenting with um, getting the scans to register properly with our 3D scanner. Uh, sometimes it's nice to cover your object in these kind of marks or dots that will uh, serve as registration marks and help the, the scans fuse together in the software. This one thing that I've been excited about with the J55 is the idea of taking a 3D model and encasing it in something else in another model. It could be any shape that you want, or it could just be like for display purposes, a clear cube. Um, so I've been kind of printing everything inside of clear cubes just on a small scale, just for funsies. Um, but this model I thought came out particularly cool. And I wanted to show it also because it looks pretty, it looks pretty clear. Um, there are some things about you can't really print like a 360 crystal clear object that I've found with the J55. Adam's got a really nice lens that he polished um, that, you know, it printed very well and is very see through from the print. And then he went beyond that and um, really made it shine. And it has to do with the orientation that you're printing in, wh um, whether or not you'll be able to kind of achieve that level. Um, and so there are always going to be some sides that don't allow for that crystal clear property. Um, but this, I think, was printed. I'm looking at it from the top of the model from how I printed it. And another thing that really helps is if it's wet. So running it under a sink and then looking at it looks dramatically different than before it got wet. And so to emulate that, there are like sprays and, you know, using things, experimenting with like spray polyurethanes to like apply to the surface of a model to make it look like it's always kind of wet, um, that can be really beneficial to play with as well. Um, just another shot of that because I thought it looked pretty cool. Um, again, playing around, this is a picture of my friend Nikki that I tried to wrap around a model of Trex head and didn't really do a very, very good job with, you know, the texture mapping and photo mapping is fairly new to me, so I'm learning a lot about it. But again, just kind of, showing what I was doing around Christmas time, which is playing. Um, this is a model that came from my research group, and I'm realizing that I don't actually know what the project that it, it's a part of is. I don't know exactly what this part does, but I know that it's um, it's taking mechanical stress. Uh, and what we were able to do in SolidWorks is to get like a map of where that stress was. So I think that it, it it's being the intent is for this part to be pushed on, on from the sides here 
and then you can see the stresses that um, happen from a simulation in SOLIDWORKS. And once you've done that simulation in SOLIDWORKS, um, you can just export that color map and print your model with the stress um, with the stresses in it. So that can be really cool for you know visualization and you know sharing a prototype of an object in a meeting that you uh, haven't made out of a more stiff material yet. Those creepy looking Shrek heads. Um, yeah, just some more models. Adam had thought that this one looked kind of cool when we looked at it last week, and I have since found out that it is a it's like a vertical air turbine. But it looks a lot to me like an object that you would find in this video game that was popular last year called Death Stranding. I'm not sure if anyone who's listening right now has played that game, but there are all these kind of zip, zip lining stations to get you from one point to another that really look kind of similar to this. Tom, is it uh, that that uh, turbine? Is it a, just like a prototype? What is it meant to serve? Is it just uh, like a, is it meant to be a wind turbine? Is it meant to be adjustable? Yeah. I think so. I think that the idea is that part of what my program, uh, like one thing that's happening in parallel to my program at MIT, the professor that I work for started the whole movement of fab labs. Um, and a fab lab is kind of like a community invention center. And at this point, there are thousands of them spread across the world. And some of them are in really um, remote locations or um, like poor locations in the world where they're not just making <clears throat> things that they want to do for for fun but they're they're making things that can actually improve their quality of life and i think that this was a design that came out of the fab lab in bhutan um and i'm not sure what their intention was if it is to build a full scale like a prototype of a a, a wind turbine um but that's that's about what that's about what i know about it cool thanks all right this is a this was a scan of the coffin of Padimut, who um, was like a priest of the god uh, goddess of goddess Mut, who I, from what I've read, was the I guess kind of supposed to be like a goddess of everything. And um, fun fact for everybody out there, there is a web page called Mummypedia, and so if you're ever trying to learn more about your favorite mummies, you can log on to Mummypedia and get some info there. Um, but this is a good example to show, um, first of all, because the model was kind of broken. You can see support through here. But also, the color didn't come out as dramatic as we had hoped for in this. And we found out that the, the reason for that is that what we're looking at is actually a very thin shell. Underneath here is all support material. And it, when you've got a very thin shell, it can't kind of print enough color material or uh, color information or print the color thick enough to really look like what it's supposed to look like. And so we found, um, we learned from Stratasys that, you know, you have to have like a recommended minimum wall thickness of three to five millimeters in order for your colors to really show up as the size you want them, um, as the color that, that you want them to. And so if your goal is to print, you know, paper thin stuff with uh, brilliant, vibrant color, I think that you might be in trouble um, with this machine. Uh, this was a project. Sometimes we do printing for research groups, other research groups at MIT that are outside of our lab, um, kind of case by case. There's only two of us uh, and there's 200 users in my facility. And so we're spread pretty thin as it is, but occasionally we'll take on um, jobs from other departments. And this one was some people that were working with lenticular lenses, um, I guess kind of similar to the idea of a holograph in a way that uh something will look one way um when you're looking at it from one direction and it will look different when you're looking at it from another direction so there's a good example of that um coming this was from sketchfab just a model of baby yoda um i wanted to show that the machine has a couple of like modes or different capabilities you can select your model whether you want to print it glossy or with a matte finish and one thing that I found is like kind of a limitation to working with this is that if you tell it that you want to print an object glossy, it does it does a great job making it glossy on the parts where it doesn't need to have any support material contacting it. 
But if you look up here on top of the head, there's kind of like a line or a separation between where there was support material and where there is not. And it's a very like dramatic difference on um, how that looks on the surface. It's not very glossy at all where it was touching the supports. Um, this is me playing around with uh, color mapping onto an object where I wanted to fade kind of a gradient from having a color to being totally clear. And so I was able to do that by using like a PNG that had transparency channel in it. And um, I don't know, I just thought that came out kind of cool. Um, more models. This one here, ooh, let's see. Wow, that's a crappy picture. Um, this came out really nice and is super see-through, uh, and, and I didn't do any post-processing to it at all. And so, depending on the orientation, the properties like uh, the color, you know, we have it clear here, and um, the orientation, and also whether or not, in this case, I had it printed glossy, uh, you can get some really shiny and clear-looking parts coming right out of the printer without doing any post-processing. Um, at least from this one direction. Um, Tom, quickly, I'm, I'm just if you could slide back for a second. Yeah. Uh, and you've had this before, but that the coral, right? That's like a piece of coral, um, like two rows in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've been I've read a little bit about um, uh, biologists that have used 3D scanning technology to scan coral. Um, to you know continue working with it as it's you know before it changes or as it's changing um and i'm thinking about how you could use that like 3d printed models in a simulated environment and i'm wondering and now i, I want to learn more about that now um but that just i just brought just wanted to bring that up that that, that there are you know there are labs doing uh, scans of coral and um, i'm wondering if they're 3d printing any of it yeah, I guess that's that's really cool. And that's something I haven't really thought about a, a whole lot. You know, it's like not that uncommon to take a series of pictures of things kind of over time to see how they change. But I haven't really heard of, you know, needing to rescan the same object on a regular basis in order to track what the changes of it are. So that's pretty cool. This one, I just like this one. It was kind of like a test coupon I did that's got a number of different springy coils um, laid out next to each other. They're all very small, and I was just playing with, again, different levels of opacity, um, different colors, levels of um, translucency. And some of them start to get kind of foggy looking. Um, when you're embedding a part inside of another part, and the outer part is clear, like a clear block. I have seen in some cases where it gets kind of foggy where there's a transition, but I haven't seen that in every print that I've done that way. And so I'd like to know more about why that happens. It could be the scale that I think that this was maybe one of the smaller things that I did of that nature. Um, and also this is kind of a bad picture. This is a good example of this is like a glass of water model. Um, you can see like where the glass is here. It's kind of it's pretty cool looking, but it's uh, it gives you an idea of what the um, level of kind of crystal clear or see through ability you get um, when you're looking at it from a side that was not oriented up and down. Um, so I think Adam in a bit is going to touch a little bit or show um, the model that he managed to like really polish to be like crystal clear. Um, but this is yeah. not on, on that level. I could, yeah, I can show that. You know what I, I, I do like about this as a specimen is you can see the jetting lines um, from the print head, right? right? That's what we're seeing, kind of uh, the, the lines on the top and on the bottom surface. Um, and Ultimately, when you when you think about transparency in an object that is transparent, as soon as the surface of any object that is trying to achieve transparency or is transparent is rigid in any, or I'm sorry, uh, um, is uh, uh, jagged, I should say, in any way, it will refract light 
and create this kind of more blurred effect that we're seeing here. Um, yeah, so it's 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 inter it's an interesting uh, process to to finish these pieces to make them transparent. Adam, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to doing some more of that because I've I've really only made a couple of like quick attempts at it and they didn't come out uh, as as nice as yours did. Mm -hmm. Someone did someone yeah. just chime in for a second? Yeah, I did, Adam um, and Tom. So just to speak on the the color and the uh, I'll come on video. Why not? Um, about the, the clarity in the, the color. Um, so I don't know if it's actually public yet or if I'm spilling the beans here, but they're supposed to be launching a couple new colors that uh, Vero Ultra Black and Ultra White this year. And that's going to allow for um, full opacity at thinner walls. So like Tom was mentioning, they said, you know, like six millimeter walls, you'll actually get the full opacity. Well, it's going to be down to two millimeters now. Oh, great. So, yeah. Um, so that'll help if, help if you're printing text or really sharp images. Uh, and then, like I said, the thinner walls as well. And then they're also launching Vero Ultra Clear, which is going to be, if you're looking at the picture that you're looking at now, you can see it's got a, like a kind of yellowish hue to it. Um, it's much more clear if you hold it up side by side, uh, more glass like. So just to throw that at you. Thanks, Matt. And I think we have some ultra clear um, in the demo lab, actually. I think Dave and Dave or myself was definitely printed with the ultra clear. Yeah, I've been using the ultra clear pretty exclusively for the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. I think the difference with the clear and the ultra clear is that the clear you might have a little bit of um, yellowing from UV light exposure. I think that might be part of what's doing that. But the ultra clear comes out what kind of what we're looking at right now, right? Cool. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh yeah, so this is the sneaker that was again. Um, the other part of that lenticular lenses project. Um, so this is a full size sneaker. It's not my size 16 sneaker, so uh, it's it didn't it was able to fit onto the print bed. Um, but this one, when you're if you're the person wearing it and you look down at your toes and you can see the words cheer up. Um, but if if you were having a, standing across from that person and ha having a conversation with them or something and you look down at their sneakers, you wouldn't be able to see it very clearly. Um, but yeah, this model is pretty cool. There's also, it also just is kind of cool the way that like the mesh, um, brought all these facets together. Like it's super low poly in, on the inside of the shoe. And I, I don't know, I have kind of a soft spot for that low poly stuff sometimes. Did a beautiful job printing this. Uh, it's really pretty amazing printer. Tom, this this model here, uh, can you tell us, do you, or if you know a little bit about the actual, because um, this is not, a, this obviously is not a scan, or or it's a scan and more. Is it like a native CAD model from the ground up? You know what? I don't know. I didn't, I never asked them that, um, whether they designed this from scratch or if they scanned it. There, mm -hmm. I, there are some things about the model that make me think like either way, like something like the way the laces look, it, it looks clean enough to me that it was not 3D scanned. But then also like the surface on the inside of the shoe looks kind of so funky that mm -hmm. that makes me believe that it might have been scanned. Right. Yeah. And another thing that I'm observing um, with respect to you know the the color variation when you change the orientation of the shoe is that uh, could you uh, pop back to the next slide yeah so here you know you see things uh seem a lot more dull i'm getting the impression that all of the uh orbs covering the shoe are all transparent none of them have color and the color is actually just on the surface underneath those right yes and that's something that i could I could tell from when I was like setting it up in GrabCAD, the way that the uh, model was split into different components. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like just a bunch of clear bubbles over this image rather than kind of incorporated into the bubbles. Um, but that is the last slide that I have got. Uh, I'm trying to think of if there's anything else that I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, I will say that we had one big like, disaster of a leak with the machine where the um, the purged waste area 
that kind of collects all of the um, stuff that didn't get printed but got heated up. It had a it failed on us and told us that there was plenty of room in the container when there actually wasn't. And so it kept putting stuff in there and we had an overflow. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's one thing that I'm always going to check in the you know, check in the negative box about this printer. It's just any printer that has, you know, what you're working with is like a sticky goo. That's what goes into the printer. That just has, you know, one way or another, you end up with it on your floor, on your keyboard, on your pants, um, one way or another. That's just been my experience with printers that print in sticky goo. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, I, I have actually one of my recent um, visits to a school. There was a very specific calibration procedure for you know the waste container, and and uh, you know we, Tom and I had talked about how you know how much attention you need to pay to that when you're setting up the printer, so to avoid that sort of stuff. Because yeah, it is it is um, yeah, it is nasty stuff. The resin that that goes into it. It's really meant to be cured with UV light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it it doesn't it doesn't want to be you know it doesn't want to be getting out of those containers and working its way into our life as a sticky goo, but it finds a way to. Right. Um, hey Adam, so, before you before you switch over, just um, a question, just while we're on the topic of goo. <laughs> Um, can you talk more about the printing material? How does it mix color? Yep, yep, I just saw that. And uh, thank you for bringing that up, Jennifer. So uh, the material is um, is a photopolymer that you would find in, you know, the same sort of stuff you would find in many of the modern resin printers. Um, and the way that the printer works, and at some point, um, I, I, you know, actually, we may as well jump into this. Uh, Dave, are you there? Um, I'll see if I can yes, get I'm here. Uh, Dave, are you willing to uh, switch to um, video and show us inside of the printer by chance? Sure. I would appreciate it. That would be great. So that, um, this, is, this goes right along with what Jennifer is asking um, with respect to how material is printed, what the material is. But they're all photopolymers uh, using a UV light to cure the, um, the resin. And uh, there is a there's an array of materials. There are some materials that Stratasys is working on that are flexible, uh, have like almost a uh, like a rubbery touch to them. Um, and then, of course, the rigid materials that you've been seeing in all of Tom's models. Um, but there is Dave Kempsky. Hi, Dave. And Hi. Dave is at our demo lab. Um, Hi, Tom. Nice job. Thank you. Great uh, and. Dave and I both have spent have been spending some quality time printing on this demo machine, and it's really wonderful. So, Dave, do you want to just say a few things about it? Sure, sure. I actually printed um, a part out earlier today. So, um, first thing to say that's really unique about this printer is the carousel or the, the table at which it prints on. There's no X Y Z gantry. Um, you have a table, and that table actually rotates. The head is located up top here. Um, so there's fewer moving parts and that, um, really, you know, I think helps in the long run with this machine. There's some really yeah, cool funky lights. So it looks almost like a disco, um, dance floor kind of when it starts to spin around. It does. Really it cool. looks great. But, um, Dave, I'm sorry. Could you just tell us, uh, you, when you say, um, the head, I think, you know, people with conventional 3d printers might be thinking about a nozzle. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Because uh, one of the other questions that was asked was, how does it mix color? Well, so I'll start. I'll, so the head is up here. T tough to really see it, but the head itself um, is comprised of microscopic, like a whole bunch of microscopic holes. And so what it's doing, I mean, this printer, the technology is is incredible. And so the way the polyjet works is that it's it's jetting out like molecules of of material and so it knows it aligns those those molecules up uh in a pattern whatever you had you know sliced up for for a model for a cad model so it i, I don't i couldn't explain it much more than that <laughs> but the way i've always seen it in in in, in powerpoint decks is that is that it's it's lining up the molecules and it, it it's smart enough to know down to that 
uh, atomic level of a, of a, mo of a molecule of, of, of material, of resin. So, Kristen, did you lose Dave's video? Yes, I was yeah. just going to ask that. Yeah, we yeah, can't see your video you. anymore. Yeah, Dave, we've so lost you. There you are. Uh, oh, now awesome. I can. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, Dave, could you just bring it up closer one more time? Sure. So uh, when he was talking about the the printhead, what the pr printhead is really very similar to the type of printhead that would be on a, a inkjet printer. It is it is very much so jetting out a fine mist of resin uh, like an inkjet printer would uh, in pixels, you know, essentially, and um, and it just builds up layer by layer. Uh, so that's how that's how it's working, and the color is being actively mixed before it exits the printhead. This is the base down here where each of the colors are loaded. So um, we have in here we have Vero Vero Ultra Clear in here. Um, we have a Vero Pure White. Um, here's like your your um, so there's there's magenta, um, there's cyan, yellow. Um, and then we have a support material as well. And so there's two bays for each of these. And these just simply, I mean, you can hot swap them. So that's what the cartridge looks like. Um, you know, for the most part, you won't see any resin whatsoever. Um, but, you know, un the unfortunate incident that Tom had, he's referring to this waste bin down here. And, you know, there there is some negatives about every technology. Every technology has its Achilles, and this is one of them. It, um it, it as it's jetting out material it's there is some waste and that's where it goes down in there and if it's it's like on a it's on a calibrated um weight weighted um or calibrated bench and so it just it just measures the weight of it and um you know there must have been a failure there with that but but i will say it's this has been it's been a great machine we've had other poly and other poly just in the past and i i think Part of that, the, the technology, they've really got it tuned in, especially with this this carousel. It, it um, it's really nice. The um, of course you got up here your your screen that you work from. So um, yeah. Any other questions on that? Uh, we do have a general question from Simon, and Simon, um, uh, I won't hold it against you if you don't come on video, but uh, it's great that you're here. It's been a long time. Um, so Simon asks if we could comment on the resiliency of the models. Um, if if they get dropped, will they hold up? Okay. And I'm going to chime in on that quickly. Um, so one model that I'm actually right here too. I, I figured I'd bring these out to kind of talk. Oh yeah, about. sure. So here is a here's a sneaker, another shoe, and uh, and we in our in our scanner we use we use Creaform for scanners. Nothing nothing wrong with our tech, but we use a Creaform scanner, which does a great job too. And uh, here's here's a, a sneaker with. I mean, certainly Adam can speak more to that, but it's got this one. This is the newer um, J55, which is a J55 Prime, which is coming out, which has um, different durometers. You can be able to mix different durometers. So the the shoe at the bottom here, the sole, is actually rubber-like, and so I mean. They are very resilient. Some people may be thinking about too when it comes to when it comes to um, multicolor 3D printing. You think about the old Z Corp machines, which which did print in color, and you could not do that for sure. So this is something uh, else that was made by a Neri, Neri Oxman at at um, MIT. This is a smaller version. If you ever go to uh, Museum of Fine Arts, you'll see a larger version of this on display. Beautiful picture that was done there. It was just a pineapple. Here is, um, and and this is the the the, clar the amount of the, the clarity, the level of clarity that you can get with some post processing. This is, you know, an idea of that. The clarity that you can get from the machine. So, um, but when it does, when it comes out, this is a part that I printed that came out, and Adam thought this might be a good idea to kind of show you this. This is a smaller version of like a little pebble that we print out in um, just two colors. It's kind of a neat little thing. But um, and what Tom was talking about is you've got the you know with Polyjet, it, it there's going to be some support material, and the support material is there, of course, to support it. And wherever it prints a support material, this is a support material. It's like a that's like a banana-like substance. It's a good way to kind of and and so anywhere it prints that out, 
you're going to get more of a dull finish to the part. So I can just peel that off with my hands. Um, we have a water jet that you use to kind of wash it off with force. Um, or I can just, I would just run this under the water and it would eventually uh, take care of it. But anywhere on the top of this is glossy. And anywhere down below here has got more of a, of a duller um, matte type finish. That's what they call it, so. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I want, just for the sake of time, I want to jump into a couple of these questions. Uh, so one of them was about um, the resiliency of the parts. And Tom, I want to ask you if you have, if you've tested any parts or you've dropped any parts, um, have you come across anything like this? Yeah, no. So I haven't gotten there yet. We do have in our lab uh, a machine called an Instron, which like its whole purpose is to smash things and tell you how much pressure it took to break them more or less or, you know, pull things apart, twist things. Uh, it's 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 made to give you an idea of how much force it took to, to do that. So I could see some Instron testing in the future, but, you know, it's like I got a lot of other things on my plate right now and it hasn't come up. Uh, it's not urgent really to do that. So. Um, I will say that it does seem kind of the rigid parts feel like they have about a similar kind of toughness to them as as acrylic does to me, um, and pretty similar to other photopolymers like form lapse prints um, with their basic uh, clear material. Uh, but yeah, I haven't gone into any detail yet. Yeah. Speak, and I, I will also uh, kind of um, mention this again but, but ahead of uh, the time that it actually comes out. So um, only by a week or so, but there'll be announcement to on the Prime, um, the J55 Prime, that um, it will have the ability to do ABS, um, like a like a simulated ABS material, which is much stronger than what it's capable of doing right now. So. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. And I'd forgotten about that. They told us that that was going to be available like around this time coming, you know, when we got the machine around Christmas time. So uh, maybe that will be coming down the pipe before long. Yeah. Um, we have another another good question here about cost. I, I can't really speak to cost other than um, the cost of like a, ten, a resin cartridge. Um, I can tell you that what you would end up doing is you know, a little bit of math based on the uh, the cost of the resin cartridge versus the weight of the print, which you can find out in the software that's used to prepare the prints. Um, and you can find that this is uh, Leslie's question. And Leslie, you can find out, I, I believe, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we do have cost for resin cartridges on our website. Uh, so if you go to adtlabs.com, um, you can find uh, set, you know, like the cost of several different cartridges, and there's a, it's a pretty broad range because there are um, there are some high quality resins and some kind of draft type resins. So um, I'm putting in some uh, some numbers that I I did the breakdown on that because I have to print for people um, sometimes, and so I will just. Uh, we kind of factored it to come out to be about 22 cents per gram of model material and 12 cents per gram of support material. And so you can just multiply those into whatever your uh, whatever it gives you as an estimate for your model's weight. And um, that can give you a ballpark idea of how much your model is going to cost. Thanks, Tom. Um, by all means, keep the uh, questions rolling. Um, I and shares too. Uh, I'm gonna swap over to my screen and just have a quick uh, dive into um, into Keyshot. So Keyshot is uh, is similar to Blender. If you've heard of Blender, Blender is um, rendering and animation software. And uh, let me switch over here. Hold on, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, all right, so what we're looking at is Keyshot and Keyshot again is yeah, so it's animation rendering software, animation software. Um, it can be used for a number of 
uh, 3D applications. But one thing that is really interesting about it that I found out early on with uh, working with the J55 was that um, Keyshot and Luxian, the company that makes Keyshot, they've put their best foot forward, making it very easy to take a, a model and uh, export this model as a 3MF file, which is a file, it's an all-inclusive 3D format file that includes all the geometry, all of the separated components. So you can see me hovering over components for this model here. Um, and not only color and uh, texture maps, but also transparency. So you see I have a transparent lens, um, and I have a pommel down here at the end of the handle that is transparent. And let me, let me bring up uh, an image here. Oops, sorry. So in the uh, original PowerPoint slide, and Kristen, can you see this okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you look on the left here, this is the uh, the this is the raw print. So this has been unfinished. Um, ha if we if we worked on this lens with uh, multiple different grits of sandpaper and added a clear coat finish, we could achieve a completely transparent lens here. And you can actually see down here um, that the light is actually being harnessed through the uh, the bent lens, which is which is pretty neat. Um, some other things you'll see is um, texture on the handle itself. And let's pop back over to Keyshot, and we can see um, some of these textures that are these are pre-made. Now, of course, um, if you're into 3D art and you're familiar with this stuff, you can custom make textures, um, which which Tom dabbled in a little bit. Uh, essentially taking like a photograph and wrapping it around a 3D object. Uh, what's really neat here is in Keyshot, we can go to our materials list over here and I can pop into um, something like cloth. And let's see. Uh, and I can drag and drop um, cloth texture right onto any of my components. Um, somebody had asked when they when they registered, some people uh, will enter comments. They asked about um, going from like CAD software like SolidWorks or Fusion 360. And um, what you're looking at here is a model that I made from the ground up in Fusion 360. So everything here is a direct translation from Fusion except for transparencies and textures. Um, so all of these components were just, uh, this whole file was exported as a step file from Fusion 360, opened up into Keyshot, and then I went in and added textures, uh, exported it and printed it on J55. The other thing I wanted to show you here uh, that is really exciting about Keyshot is what's called um, displacement. And um, quickly, and Tom, Tom and I would talked about this a little bit. I think he and I are both kind of um, newcomers to this field, but it's really interesting. So what we're looking at here is called a texture map, or and in some cases it might be referred to as a bump map. And what a bump map is, is a two-dimensional uh, image that is wrapped around a three-dimensional object to give the illusion that it is it has like texture. So what you're looking at here is like a simulated leather handle or a simulated leather texture, all right? Um, now, what's really neat about Keyshot is if I go into my handle, uh, my upper handle dialog, and I open up what's called the material graph, and this is um, these graphs are are very common in um, in rendering software. What we can do is we can take our our bump map, so you can see here our leather, 2D leather texture, which is right here, is plugged into our material, our plastic material, um, and then it outputs into the surface of the material. But if I add a displacement node 
And instead of going into the bump map, remember when I say bump map, it's not geometric bumps. It's just giving the illusion. What it does, if I click it into this place here and I refresh the nodes, you can see that it just, uh, in the background here, you can see that we have now displaced the geometry of the part based on the bump map, which is just an awesome technology to me. So essentially what it's doing is um, it's taking the, the shadowed areas and the light areas and basically the pixel map and it's raising and lowering uh, or elevating, displacing um, the geometry based on that image. And that's exactly what we see here. And what's great about this with respect to 3D printing, <laughs> This is so cool. It looks like an antler handle, actually. Um, so what's really neat about this, you doing this with the J55 is now I, I have a rendered geometry here. This will export as geometry in this shape, and I can print it on the J55 with this, uh, this new texture. And I'm going to stop on that um, because there's really not much more to say on it. It's just really neat stuff. Um, and I haven't looked at the chat. Does anyone have any questions on this? There was a question earlier that we didn't get to. Um, yeah. Where is it? Oh, what is the disposal process for the waste? Oh, yeah. Uh, so disposal is, um, I mean, I believe, uh, it's, it is considered a hazardous material when it is not, uh, at least the resin, not the support material. Um, when it's in resin form, I believe it's considered a hazardous material. So um, whatever facility you're at, you would need to um, dispose of it as such. Uh, as soon as it gets cured, on the other hand, the material, the, the properties of the material, in fact, change. And I will say that if anybody, um, if anybody does want to know more about this and you want to schedule kind of like a follow up with someone from our sales team to kind of go over even more in depth into materials, Stratasys provides a lot of information on their materials. They have thorough information, safety sheets with respect to um, the, the um, properties of it as a resin and as a, as a polymerized plastic. I will just speak a little bit more on that too, Adam. Um, with our system here, um, we don't have a formal way of, of disposing of, of hazardous waste. And like you said, when, once it is in a cured form, it is, it is okay. Um, so with the waste, then what I do with that is I take it, it comes, it's in a box, but then inside the box is a plastic bag. So you take that out and I actually just bring it outside in the beating sun and leave it in the beating sun for for a couple of days and because it's a photopolymer and it cures to uv light a couple of days later it will be rock solid so wow the whole container I, dave the whole container no yeah kidding. i did i flip i flip it over once or twice yeah. but i have a place wow. sunny side of my hair i just flip it so that's one way Great. of doing it now that's the unofficial okay. way that's that's so but you know other you you, you need to follow your local rules and regulation in, yeah. of your town whatever well, I love that you bring that up, Dave, because a lot of us um, are kind of like makerspace hackers by nature, and we love trying to, <laughs> you know, uh, navigate just exactly what you said. That's great. Um, I want to bring up one more slide uh, as we're kind of coming out to a, a close here. Um, let's see. I do have, I don't know if uh, Jennifer Carson, you have a hand raised. I'm not sure if that was from before. I apologize if it is. Oh, no, it's new. Hi. Oh, great. Um, Adam, yeah, hi. Yeah, Adam, what you were just showing with the, so Keyshot, I, that's, I'm fairly new to that. I'm wondering, uh, uh, just a couple of things, is why, um, what is your interest in this? And this software, obviously, there's lots of other things like Rhino comes to mind, and mm. um, and you did mention Blender too. Um, that yeah. was my first question. But then I'm also just wanted to, if I could just get a quick review of the terminology that is used to describe that what you just showed us, where it basically took a texture and then turned it into a 3D surface. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you bring it up. Um, so my interest stems from really directly from using Blender and finding it to be quite frustrating. 
So <laughs> Blender is freeware, so you can get Blender for free. And if you are the um, if you are the type of teacher, educator, or self taught um, student that can dig into that stuff easily, then that's wonderful. I, I touch base on Blender a little bit to do a little bit of 3D like painting. Um, but when it came into stuff like this, I, I found it was it was really a struggle. And um, I think it was Dave originally who had told me about Keyshot because Stratasys had partnered with Keyshot uh, or Keyshot had partnered with Stratasys. I suppose it's the same specifically to work on this throughput. Um, I don't know if Blender will export like a 3MF file, um, certainly not as smoothly. I don't think it does. I think I can safely say it doesn't, um, and certainly not as smoothly as Keyshot does. So that is, uh, that is a big pro to Keyshot. Also, just the learning curve of me being able to go here to one of the components, right-click on it, hover over material, and open the material graph. It just gave me a really nice um, understanding on how this worked. And while I'm on that, I'll just tell, touch base again on um, what we looked at before with regard to terminology. All right, so what I had talked about was um, the, the key terms are really uh, texture, bump map. Here we see bump. So texture map, bump map, and displacement. So if I... Um, Right now I have my displacement map uh, or my displacement node isn't plugged in right now. So if I refresh the geometry, you can see me clicking on this geometry nodes refresh button up here. Well, what it goes to is my native CAD model with everything flat. Uh, and what you're looking at here in the background is a texture map um, or bump map of a leather material. And that's something that's just based on a 2D image. It's a 2D image wrapped around um, a 3D object in this case. And then displacement is taking a bump map and it is displacing the geometry it's been applied to based on, yeah, I wanna say based on um, almost more of like a grayscale. So if you see darker, you know, darker kind of lines in here, that will stay kind of sunken in and the lighter spaces will get elevated. So when I plug in um, leather, the leather texture to the dis displacement map, we get this. And of course, this is kind of wild. Like I've actually, I went into the settings and adjusted it a little bit um, to be like really elevated. But if I, what I would probably do to simulate leather is I would really tone this down a little bit to make it, um, you know, not like a is is uh, is rough. Adam, one thing, one thing. Um, th that was a great question and a great way of, of answering answering it. Um, but one thing that I take away again from uh, I'm, I'm certainly in no way nearly as well versed as you guys are, um, you are, and other people. And one thing I I've taken away from from Stratasys over the years, and more recently, especially the J55 and and using GrabCAD print, is that using STL files, STL files are really dumb. They don't have any information within them. And so the, the one takeaway I get from using GrabCAD, and especially with the J55, is you know using, uh, using any file format other than STLs is going to be helpful to you um, because of what you can then do. And, and Tom's, you know, Tom's, I see Tom nodding, and you probably know what I'm talking about there as well. Yeah, it's definitely like um, there were just years and years where all 3D prints that, you know, files that I got from students or people that I was going to be printing were STLs. And now it's like slowly I'm barely seeing any STLs anymore. You know, everybody's interested in working with having more going on in their file than just the the faceted mesh. Absolutely. Yeah, OBJ files and, and other um, direct imports from, from um, na the native CAD um, program itself, but you, we could certainly talk for another couple hours and maybe Adam, this certainly is um, a subject or a topic that we could um, expand upon in some of our future Tech Tuesdays for sure. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I like that you're bringing it up because if you look at the slide I just brought up at the bottom um, of this slide, and this is kind of our closeout slide, 
Um, you have some links that you should be able to click on. So if you can see the slide right now on your screen, you should be able to hover over and click on these links. One goes to our AT Labs website Stratasys page or J55 page. The other two go directly to um, GrabCAD print software and Keyshot software pages. And I wanted, I really want you to, um, if you're interested in learning more about these, I would strongly encourage you to open these up right now and bookmark them because GrabCAD print, you can down, you just have to register for an account and you can download it and work with different types of Stratasys printer templates. And you can really like start dragging in CAD assemblies and working like with the J55 template and like adding colors in GrabCAD if you wanted to. Alternately, you could do a trial of Keyshot. You could go to Keyshot's website, get download a trial, and work with what I'm doing right now. Um, and of course, you know I'm I love learning um, through tutorials. So this is exactly what I did when I when I uh, made um, this displacement map for the magnifying glass. So yeah, so those links are there. Um, and uh, the last thing I just want to touch on is um, you know. Uh, when Kristen, Tom, and I met uh, about this Tech Tuesday today, we kind of just wanted to give um, an overview of, of our applications and what we are actively using these for and what other people that have multicolor printers are using these for. And, um, and we made that list here, optical lenses, design prototyping, artifact preservation, which Tom certainly, um, some folks he's been working with has been doing, anatomical models. Um, that, that makes me really think about um, med schools and uh, professors that are looking to uh, generate models specifically for um, a section of their class. Maybe they're having trouble finding a specific model or they want to revolutionize what they're teaching. They could actually just make a transparent anatomical model or a translucent anatomical model and print it. Um, Tom, I don't think we, we, we touched on this in our preliminary meeting, but fluid dynamics and microfluidics, um, you had mentioned, Tom, that there was one uh projects that you were dig starting to dig into right with this yeah or you know just seeing what kind of um printing very fine channels and then pumping fluid through them um which i don't understand that i'm not like a a, a bio person really but i think that there are applications in my lab where that's basically what people are doing but even aside from not understanding what what they're doing uh, it visually, those part pieces can be super, super cool looking too. Um, yeah. Just having like networks of channels that are kind of with different colored fluids pumping through them. Yeah, and imagine, imagine if you had, uh, you know, yeah, like treated fluids that reacted to different types of light. You know, and like, uh, it would, it, I mean, it would just look really neat. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the if last note was. Yeah, Sorry, sorry about that. Um, if I could say one more thing to um, before I forget, for anyone who would like to who is, who is, who is interested in, in multicolor printing, um, has a project in mind that they would like to explore further, we would absolutely work with you. We have a we have a machine here. We can be happy to print out a benchmark for you. Adam could work with you in the design and the coloring of that. And so I just want to make sure I put that out there um, to you. Uh, Randy Briggs, um, also from from Keyshot, is is on here listening in, and and um, he's they, they've offered uh, special discounts for any of our um, any of our anyone that's that's here today. So there's uh, discounts for, in, with Keyshot, um, and it's very reasonable, you know, of course, with for the EDU market, anyways. Um, and also, I wanted to do, give a shout out to Josh Ramos. If you want to, if you talk, and, and this was really about about um, applications. Josh is from is also from MIT, but he's from the Toy Lab. And um, without um, trying to get you guys to that website, if you go to our website, um, uh, we just put a blog post up, and and you can kind of follow, you see, see some of the pictures in there, um, how they use the J their, their J55, and we worked with them on a partnered with them on a project to help print out. Um, some of their overload because they had like 80 different. Oh, thank you. Is that um, thank you? That is that's a uh, link to it. Um, just I, 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 I just think some of these came out just so amazing. I mean, so and that the toy lab makes designs toys and does a lot more of not just toys, but certainly um, you'll, you can learn more about it. But 
the models that they put out are phenomenal and and you got to take a look at the website because it is just amazing so that's all i'll say on that and uh thank you everyone for joining us thanks dave and uh tom big thanks to you uh for joining us today and just kind of going off what dave is saying um i think uh a lot of us just share when we share the excitement in the projects that we're doing. It just kind of elevates our interest, elevates our um, uh, our ability to learn and dig into more and um, improve our own projects. So I hope you join us again. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, it was great to be here. All right. Thanks so much, Tom. Great stuff you're doing over there. Thanks. Well, see you guys. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. Until next time.